Okay, so welcome back to our Jepson mini workshop on biodiversity challenges, California floristics, taxonomy, and phylogenetics. And this will be module two of changing taxonomic approaches over time. And I finished up with the last module talking about how a phylogenetic taxonomy was, a, was long ago for me, but that um, it was something that wasn't really within grasp until the late 20th century. And if we go back and look at um, traditionally presented phylogenies, not Darwin's, but those that often appear in older liter literature, Phylogeny is often depicted as a linear sequence. And a really classic example of this are human evolution dioramas, these um, parades of increasingly uh, modern looking individuals um, parading in, with the modern humans in front. And this kind of depiction, um, we could get away with that for humans because today we're the only hominids left on the planet but there were times earlier in human history where we were sharing the planet with other hominids that were the result of a branching phylogeny where we actually did have um, major divergences going on within the hominid phylogeny. And so uh, this view of evolution as a linear sequence led to a lot of problems in thinking about phylogeny in general, where even modern species could be shown. Um, in some diagrams of plant evolution, for example, as the ancestors of other modern species. And that might be somewhat accurate if we're dealing with exceedingly rapidly evolving species. It's generally a misconception. And relationships also, another point, were often equated with similarity. And you'd see often the terms related to uh, and similar to used interchangeably. And in fact, you know, that was the basis for a lot of taxonomies was just overall similarity in terms of how things would be grouped into taxa. But unfortunately, similarity, overall similarity doesn't always reflect recency of common ancestry, which is by any criterion, the true definition of relatedness. I mean, just because you look a bit more like one of your first cousins than you do one of your siblings doesn't mean you're more closely related to your first cousin. And the same is true in comparing species. Sometimes, as we'll see later today, um, the closest relatives of a species might look very different from them compared to a more distantly related species if there's been unequal rates of evolutionary change through lineages. And this came up in the question, question and answer for module one. Um, what is the rate of evolutionary change? Well, it can depend on what the conditions are that might promote evolutionary change. We might see more rapid evolution in some lineages than others. And that can lead to problems in using an overall similarity criterion for inferring relationship. But that's basically what was available to botanists traditionally. And we don't have to go back that far in time to um, get to that point where people were basing their judgments about what constitutes one taxon versus another, as opposed to just variation within a taxon, uh, using judgment calls. And so the opinions of individuals that knew a lot about plants um, were often the basis for how plants were classified. And a great example of this is late 19th century, late 19th century California plant taxonomy, where different individuals that, both, that knew the flora very well um, could have a very different interpretation of what constitutes a species. And a great pairing to discuss this um, very topic are Edward Lee Green on the left here and Kate Brandegee on the right, who were contemporaries um, born just a year apart and almost lived through the exact same time period. Both very prominent plant taxonomists in the Bay Area um, Kate Brandegee also in Southern California for quite a long time. And they both had very strong opinions about taxonomy. Green was a pastor, he was religious, creationist, and he had a very narrow conception 
of the variation that was encompassed within species. And Kate Brandegee um, was a Darwinist, um, an avowed atheist at a time when confessing to atheism was even less popular than it is today. And she was very much attuned to the potential for variation within species and had a very broad species concept. So we can think, you know, think of these two as exemplifying the tradition of splitting and lumping taxonomically. And of course, um, as you might guess, since there weren't great tools available to be able to discern who was right about um, a narrow versus broad species concept, um, they, there, there was not good feelings between these two individual two individuals. And uh, Green referred to Kate Brandegee as a she-devil, and Kate Brandegee said to the effect, something to the effect of not one in 10 of green species were anything more than a figment of his imagination. But uh, history's been kinder to these two individuals than they were to each other. And they made major contributions to uh, plant taxonomy. Of course, you know, there were mistakes, but they, they had very good uh, um, gestalt and ability to make good judgment calls about plants. So um, you'll see their names associated with with plants in California uh, very commonly in terms of being the authors of particular species or other taxa. And uh, I wanna just give you, uh, present to you one quote here from another prominent botanist of that time, Marcus Jones. And you can just see how nasty this kind of feeling could be between botanists of that era this is an excerpt from an obituary of Green written by Marcus Jones. Green, the pest of systematic botany has gone and relieved us of his botanical drivel. They say that the good that men do lives after them, but the evil they do is interred with their bones. I suspect his grave must've been a big one to hold it all, all that evil that is. So um, yeah, you can see it was a poisonous atmosphere and it extended around the country. Um, at Harvard, it was no different. Um, Jeffrey and uh, Fernald were at each other's throats too, to the extent that the president of Harvard was said to have remarked, what is it about the pretty little flowers that makes the botanists hate each other? So, um, so that's the kind of situation you can get into when there aren't good criteria for, um, for making judgments about uh, decision-making in science. So by the early 20th century, uh, once Mendel's work was rediscovered on inheritance in peas, and there, was, uh, there were other rapid advances in genetics. For example, the discovery that chromosomes were um, associated with the stuff of heredity. There was really strong unhappiness developing with the practices of taxonomists, not just by one another, but also by non-taxonomists. And there started to be a growing impetus to incorporate uh, more objective criteria, more scientific criteria into decision-making about taxonomy and especially about what constitutes a species using biological, genetic, um, and experimental criteria. And so this tradition in systematics, uh, basically experimental taxonomy came to be called biosystematics. And the name biosystematics just refers to using biological criteria to generate an evolutionarily sound system of classification. So the system of systematics refers to the system of classification. And inherent in all this was a belief in species as a special rank within the overall hierarchy of, um, of taxonomic categories. And I wanna make a call out to Harvey Monroe Hall, who was a Berkeley taxonomist, but also in his later years was a founder of the plant biosystematic initiatives at Stanford University within the Carnegie Institution of Washington's plant biology group. And he uh, was involved in some of the earliest biosystematic studies in plants. And in a paper, a famous paper of his with Babcock, on the hayfield tar weeds, he, he, I took this quote from this paper because I feel like it could have been said today 
a very modern statement, phylogeny must be taken as the guiding principle in taxonomic study. The question of how large or small a species should be becomes one of convenience or usability and is not to be compared in importance with the much more fundamental consideration of its naturalness and its relationships. So Hall um, really felt strongly that the variation, trying to understand the basis for all the variation that we see within plant groups was critical to um, coming up with a sound phylo phylogenetic based classification. And so he initiated these experimental studies first by hiring uh, David Keck at the far right here and Bill Heisey in the center who were both PhD students at UC Berkeley that were uh, graduating around the time he was headed off to Stanford. And they formed a team uh, to undergo, the, to, to initiate these biosystematic studies. And they realized they needed a cytogeneticist, someone working with chromosomes. Uh, it was well understood at that point that chromosomes were closely tied to heredity. And they hired a Danish botanist, Jens Clausen, here at the left. But then shortly afterwards, Hall um, got sick and died. He came down with some kind of contagious illness on a trip and died prematurely in his 50s. And what would have been the Hall, Clausen, Keck, and Heisey team became the Clausen, Keck, and Heisey team that is famous today for their uh, experimental systematic studies and um, other studies involving these biosystematic approaches that are really signatures of um, even modern experimental studies that attempt to look at the nature of variation in plants. And so I do wanna go through briefly these approaches, which were classic, but still utilized, um, of course. Um, the first is the one they're best known for, reciprocal transplant experiments. So these are basically common garden experiments in natural settings. Um, going back to Kate Brandegee that I mentioned earlier, uh, she was definitely of the opinion this kind of work was important. And Harvey Monroe Hall corresponded with her early on. Uh, felt, she felt that some of the differences between so-called species, or maybe even in some cases between so-called genera, might just be the, the result of, of phenotypic plasticity in different environmental settings. And then only by bringing things into a common garden um, could you really assess this. And so these early studies of the Clausen, Keck, and Heisey team took widespread plant species that showed variation across their ranges and within which there'd been a number of taxa, species level taxa proposed historically. And they basically uh, took clones of each of these plants. These are generally rhizomatous things they could break apart and move them to different outdoor gardens along a west to east transect from Stanford up to and beyond the crest of the Sierra. Here you can see the Sierra Nevada, Great Basin here, um, and these different experimental transplant stations where they would place representatives from each of the transplant stations in a common garden and, and try to assess to what extent are their differences uh, maintained or, um, or not. And on that basis, they could um, decide whether there was evidence of local adaptation and maybe even evidence of sufficient evolutionary divergence to warrant um, taxonomic recognition. And here's an example from the Yaros in Akalea um, across this transect looking at plants grown in these different localities. So that's a powerful method. It's a lot of work to do it, but it can be done. And there've been recent examples where it's been very informative for um, understanding local adaptation in ways that have helped understand the evolutionary process, including work by graduate students recently at Berkeley. Um, a second method they used was Mendelian genetic analysis. And this is just getting back to looking at segregation ratios and hybrids hy after hybridiz uh, hybridization to try to understand the genetic basis for traits that differ between different plants. And this could be used in some cases to understand differences between plants that had been thought to represent different taxa. And a great case in the genus Leia, the tidy tip genus of um, members of the tarweed group, 
is the example of Cali glossa and um, oxyura. So at, um, it was recognized that in these populations of, um, of some layers, we would see fruits that were formed that have uh, hairy um, sipsily outer surfaces like this, as well as a pappus at the tip of the fruit, as well as individuals that are glabrous fruited and that don't have a pappus like the one on the right here. And traditionally, these have been placed in different genera. Uh, the fruit characteristics and pappus characteristics of members of the sunflower family have often been given high priority in classification and compositing, often even at the level of tribes that rank above genera and below family. And in this case, at one time, plants like this have been called oxyura, plants like this have been cal called caliglossa. Klausenkeck and Heise um, crossed plants that had these different fruit morphologies, and they got a first generation hybrid that had the glabrous fruit without the pappus. And then they took it to the next generation and they got a three to one segregation ratio uh, with three quarters of the plants having the glabrous non-pappus fruit morphology and one quarter of them having the, um, the hairy fruits with the pappus. And so it was pretty clear that this was a single gene and a single uh, two alleles controlling this trait that there was a suppressor allele that was dominant that was suppressing the production of hair and pappus. And um, it was a simple dominant recessive uh, situation where this is the dominant condition and this is the recessive condition. And today we treat plants like this um, as members of the same species, Leia chrysanthemoides, and this is just variation that sorts out with, or just uh, segregates within populations. So this is just an extreme example of how the Mendelian genetic analysis could be very informative um, taxonomically. Also chromosomes were a really important line of evidence for looking at relationships and they continue to be, this is a still an active area, although the number of people that still do chromosomal work is dwindling. It's relatively um, time consuming and difficult, but it has great rewards. And we definitely found it to be really helpful in our studies in the sunflower family. So as I mentioned earlier, chromosomes were associated with heredity by the early 1900s, a full 50 years before DNA was revealed to encode genes with the work that was credited to um, Watson and Crick later. But Sutton came up with the chromosomal theory of inheritance 50 years earlier. The nice thing about chromosomes is you could actually see them under simple light microscopy, especially phase microscopy. And so um, you didn't need, uh, you know, definitely the tools of the trade were, were around early on to be able to look at chromosomes if you had sufficient skill to do so. And as you're no doubt aware, chromosome numbers can vary widely within plant groups uh, across closely related species and some genera. And chromosome number and structure differences have major importance with regard to their effect on interfertility. So if you cross plants of different chromosome number or even with the same chromosome number, but that have chromosomes that differ in structure, that have rearrangements that differentiate them of parts or whole chromosome arms, um, the progeny that will result from such hybridizations will be of reduced fertility. So it can reduce, or in, in some cases have zero fertility. So this is an important trait that can affect fertility of hybrids. Also st structural differences between chromosomes um, can also lock up uh, adaptive gene complexes in ways that can be really important, basically, acting like super genes that can house genes associated with things like drought tolerance that um, will not recombine with um, other species if they do hybridize. So this is something that uh, is a really important factor in understanding plant evolution. 
And the differences between plants with different chromosome numbers or structure can be really um, valuable for even inferring relationships. If you do careful meiotic surveys, you can figure out, for example, how many chromosomal rearrangements differentiate any pair of taxa and can figure out the number of macro mutations of, the, of that type that separate any pair of species within a group. Also, plants undergo considerable amounts of polyploidization. That is where you'll get genomic doubling, something that's not very commonly tolerated in vertebrates, for example, and, uh, but it can rapidly lead to speciation in plants. And it commonly is, follows after hybridization. So the so-called allopolyploidy is a condition of being a hybrid polyploid where you get a hybridization, the chromosomes don't pair as they should because the parents are too divergent. And then as a result of the failure of the first meiotic division that's involved in um, sporogenesis, we end up with pollen and ovules that are diploid instead of haploid that have twice as many chromosomes as they should. They get together um, sperm and egg, and we end up with, for example, in that case, a tetraploid with um, two very different sets of chromosomes within the same plant that, that is reproductively isolated with its diploid parent species. And if they have an ecological context, it's very, oftentimes these polyploids are ecologically different. Um, they fall outside the ecological ranges of their parent species, and they can persist as new species that are reproductively isolated from their parent species. And Klaus and Keck and Heise actually experimentally made such allopolyploids. For example, here you can see a plant now today called Harmonia nutans, and here's Yenzia ramii. They made the F1, and after they got into the F3 uh, generation, they actually recovered polyploids um, from that. So, and in some cases, they're able to experimentally reconstruct uh, allopolyploids that uh, were quite similar to, to naturally occurring polyploids. So there was a lot that could be learned from chromosomes and still is. Finally, um, these different kinds of genetic analyses generally require making hybrids. And so in the course of such work, uh, one can gain a lot of information about the crossability of plants, whether you can make hybrids between them. And if you can, how fertile are those hybrids so crossability and interfertility assessments, um, big data sets could be acquired by making uh, crosses. For example, here you can see in the genus Media, as it was circumscribed at the time, it's been broken up since then because you can see there's some major barriers here that actually translated to quite distant relationship among some of these species. But uh, most of the hybrids that have been made successfully within the genus Media or between species that historically were treated in the genus Media were highly sterile. And um, this is what Vern Grant later called the Media pattern, pointing to Klaus and Keck and Heise's data here from this crossing polygon where each of these circles is representative of, of a different species. And you can see the chromosome numbers here that differ quite a bit. Um, and this is just the pattern commonly seen in a lot of annuals of. Um, rapid, uh, rapid uh, evolution of intersterility barriers. But, but these data have their limitations and this conceptualization of relationships between the genera Media and Leia to the tarweed genera by Clausen, I think illustrates some of those problems. Basically what these are, are crossing polygons and we're, they're tilted at an oblique angle here with the, the um, lines between them representing successful hybridization being pulled down into a phylogenetic-like diagram that looks kind of like, I don't know, it looks pretty gnarly, kind of a gnarlogram. And you can even see like this line here where a very sterile hybrid was once created between these. And the suggestion that these crossability relationships actually allow us to infer phylogeny, but it's important to realize that crossability and interfertility, like overall similarity, 
our ancestral characteristics that are lost at different rates in different lineages. I mean, there can be selection for reproductive barriers. And so um, there's a limit to the, the informativeness of such characters for inferring relationships. And, uh, but nonetheless, this kind of evidence, this biosystematic evidence, really important. And they made a lot of um, taxonomic refinements to groups that have held up over time. So after that period, um, biosystematics moved into, into the 1960s where chemistry started to become utilized more and more. And the first chemicals um, that were used in a major way were so-called secondary compounds or secondary metabolites. These compounds are not um, primary metabolites not involved, for example, in primary metabolism or structure, but things like terpenes, flavonoids, phenols that um, are, are in, involved in other functions like plant defense against herbivores and oftentimes un, of unclear function. In fact, um, many biologists at the time thought that these were waste products of plants that didn't really have any function at all. But ecologists have subsequently shown that they um, are important to plants, which can't get up and run away from their predators, their herbivores, their pests, and rely on a rich chemistry of compounds that um, help to protect them. And the chemistry of plants, uh, secondary chemistry, can be incredibly complex. And there's a lot of chemistry here that potentially could um, function as evolutionary markers. And so there was a lot of interest in this um, beginning in the early 1960s work by Alston and Turner. And in the end, it turned out that these types of data, which are gene products rather than genes themselves, turned out to be very strongly subject to parallel evolution, convergent evolution, different biochemical pathways leading to the same compounds, um, evolving independently in different plant groups. And in some plants, and also just the, um, life, the life stage of an individual plant, its developmental stage, or whether or not it's been grazed or attacked by, a different, by an organism could affect its overall chemistry because these chemicals are sometimes deployed um, in response to assaults against plants or in response to any kind of environmental challenge. So it was tricky to use these data for resolving phylogeny, but they did turn out to be really useful, for example, as markers for hybridization. And a lot of hybrids came to be um, diagnosed by uh, the use of secondary compounds that, for example, could help to realize that what someone had recognized as a species was actually not a species, but a spontaneous hybrid between a couple of species. And then in the 1970s, a more sophisticated, or I shouldn't say this, um, uh, another approach was um, developed, um, enzyme electrophoresis, where different plant enzymes were uh, isolated, different systems were developed, where um, different stains could be used, for example, to look at different, uh, different forms of enzymes of plants, and these could be separated out by allele in an electric field on um, starch gels, for example, like you see here. And what we're seeing in each lane here is a different extraction from a different plant. And we're seeing different um, fragments here that represent different um, polypeptides, different proteins that, that uh, differ between individuals. Uh, where we have different allelic forms of that particular enzyme. So so-called allozymes or isozymes uh, were used primarily to look at microevolutionary questions like um, gene flow or variation within populations or hybridization again, uh, but in some cases providing really good species markers um, that could be used for um, diagnosing species that could be hard to tell apart. And in fact, this line of evidence is still used very actively and effectively in some groups of plants like the moonworts. 
in um, Athioglossales, that fern group, uh, Batrichium and relatives. And then in the 1980s, it started to become possible to actually look at, indirectly to look at actual genes without um, too much difficulty, although it was grueling work. Um, the, anyone could do it if they had the right equipment. Uh, this is a technique called restriction site analysis and involving restriction enzymes that cut DNA at particular uh, four to six base pair recognition sites. And these are enzymes isolated from bacteria that break up the DNA um, at particular sites and can be used by bacteria in an offensive or defensive way. But um, there were a large number of these restriction enzymes that were isolated that broke DNA at different recognition sites and could be used as ways of indirectly looking for mutations, the presence or absence of mutations within DNA. And this was a technique um, utilized for high copy number DNA generally, like chloroplast DNA found inside the chloroplast genome of plants and nuclear ribosomal DNA, which is present in large copy number within the genomes of plants and other organisms. And so here's just an example of how you might analyze those data. You like in um, protein gel electrophoresis or enzyme electrophoresis, you run out, in this case, not the protein fragments, but DNA fragments, the digestive, the products from a digest using a particular enzyme, like in this case, ECOR1. And um, what we can see on the left are a series of fragments of known size. This, these are um, molecular weight standards. And then on the right, we have a different individual here that has some of the same bands, but here it's lacking this thousand base pair band and instead has these two bands not found in, in, the, right, in the left lane. You can see these two bands that would add up in molecular weight to this band. And you could then infer that there was a single mutation difference between a, individual A and individual B. In this case, the presence of a restriction site that broke this fragment here into two fragments and the absence of that restriction site in this individual A. And you do this for large numbers of restriction enzymes and um, much um, and long pieces of DNA and come up with a big data set of restriction site mutations that could then be used to um, using phylogenetic analyses to infer a phylogenetic tree, coming up with the simplest hypothesis um, to explain the presence or absence of restriction sites at all these different sites in comparisons between um, different um, taxa or different um, samples in the analysis. And this is basically how I spent the late 1980s as a graduate student doing this kind of work in addition to crossing studies and herbarium studies. And it's a grueling approach. And within a matter of about a week or about, I should say, over the course of years, I developed a large enough data set to be able to look at relationships between tarweeds and silver swords. And that amount of data could have been acquired in the matter of about a week um, after DNA sequencing became possible to do in the 1990s. And so right around 1990, um, it became possible to amplify DNA, actually in the late 80s even, it became possible to amplify DNA regions as long as you knew the flank, the sequence of flanking regions that sit on either side of those DNA regions. And the DNA regions we'd be sequencing would be anywhere from just a few hundred base pairs to a couple thousand base pairs in length. And if, as long as you had prior data, very hard won data about um, conserved regions that flank variable regions, you could amplify pieces of DNA, um, basically effectively isolating those pieces of DNA from a genomic extraction um, just by amplifying it through these different rounds of um, the polymerase chain reaction or PCR, where enzymes will make a new 
double-stranded molecule for each single strand of a given double-stranded piece of DNA. And you do that over and over again, 30 or 40 rounds, and you're exponentially increasing the amount of DNA of that little region until that's um, that, 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 that DNA is vastly uh, in excess of all the rest of the genomic um, DNA in your sample. So you effectively isolate it, and then you can use methods that had been in existence for a long time to do DNA sequencing and, and actually come up with the actual genetic code of A's, C's, G's, and T's, as you see here on um, acrylamide gels you know, uh, through electrophoresis again. And there are a lot of other marker-based approaches using PCR that could be used to look at phylogeny and population level questions. And so this is a finer grain data and easier to acquire and would allow for large phylogenetic analyses that are really the, the basis for most of what we know about phylogenetic relationships at this point. But from the 2000s onward, whole genome sequencing became possible. Um, although it's still quite expensive, it's become far less expensive to amplify, for example, a targeted set of maybe four or 500 genes um, from the nuclear genome and uh, examine relationships based on all those different genes using the same kinds of phylogenetic analyses um, that try to optimize the relationships, either coming up with the simplest tree or the most probable tree using various criteria. And this um, is really revolutionizing the ability to look at finer grain questions like the importance of hybridization during evolutionary change by comparing gene trees from different chromosomes and trying to work out so-called reticulate evolution in addition to um, divergent evolution. All right, so that's a longer section and we're gonna stop now to take some questions. So um, please ask away.